Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Renee Navarro, and I'm the Vice Chancellor of Diversity and Outreach here at UCSF. Our office is every day solely focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion at UCSF. And uh, we are so proud to be with you here today and to have such a large um, responsive audience here today to talk about this critical issue. Unfortunately, um, it's necessary, but it's, it's great that the community is here to discuss what our plans are going to be moving forward. I first have to specifically call out and ask to stand up our two campus coordinators for DACA, Dr. Alejandro Rincon, who is also Assistant Vice Chancellor and Chief of Staff for the Office of Diversity and inclusion. And Dr. Lamisha Hill, who is also the director of the Multicultural Resource Center. I thank them and our panelists for really pulling this together today. And again, I thank all of you for being here. On behalf of Chancellor Hoggood, I welcome you uh, this afternoon. And I, think, I thank you for the support and your participation and your ongoing advocacy on behalf of our Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, the DACA program. It's now more important uh, than ever before for us to stand shoulder to shoulder together in defense of the rights for those who are members of the DACA program. With Attorney Jeff Sessions' um, horrific and callous announcement on Tuesday, you know, a six-month window uh, wind down has been initiated. But thankfully, uh, this announcement has been met with a vociferous, um, coordinated uh, opposition across the political spectrum, across institutions of higher education, employers, and other national leading organizations. There are several attorney generals who have already uh, issued and started lawsuits against this reversal of DACA. So we have a long way to go. And we're going to be fighting this all the way down the line. So. The University of California, uh, we're fortunate that our president, Janet Napolitano, really initiated this in 2012 as the then Secretary of Homeland Security. And she, uh, hopefully you've seen the announcement that she sent out to all of our campuses. Uh, in addition to that, she has been working with our state legislature. She sent um, a, an announcement to the federal, our federal um, leadership in Congress uh, opposing uh, changing the rights to the DACA group, to the California Congressional Group. So there are several avenues of advocacy. UC System has an advocacy unit in Washington, D.C., and they too will be working um, with us and our campus delegations to, to see that we in fact retain the rights of individuals who are a part of DACA. Our Chancellor uh, wishes he could be here, but certainly stands with us in our fight uh, and will be continuing to support our dreamers, our students, our staff, who are also members of, of DACA. So from a legal perspective, we'll hear more today about how we're working with you to protect your rights, um, to our support for your ongoing education for all of our learners, for this climate of inclusion for those of you who are employed here. We stand with you, and we will be um, continuing to do so. Without much further ado from me, I wanted to introduce Dr. Amber Fitzsimmons, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Physical Therapy and Rehabilitation Science, as well as in the Department of Anatomy. She will serve as our moderator this afternoon and introduce our distinguished panel. So again, thank you for being here, uh, Amber. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we want to ex uh, really extend a, a sincere appreciation for everybody here um, from senior leadership, our faculty, our staff, um, our students, and of course our community members as well who've come to um, learn about the updates. Um, I do want to remind everybody that we welcome a diversity of perspectives and questions um, during today's event, but I do want to um, acknowledge that it's been a very um, distressing and vulnerable time for people in our community, and I hope that we can um, share our thoughts 
um, in a very respectful way today. Um, the purpose of the event is twofold, so I'll tell you a little bit about the logistics. Um, we're going to update the UCSF community about changes in uh, DACA program and to do so in an inclusive session and the ramifications of these changes. And also to have a time to better understand what we can do as a community to support, to advocate, and to bring a call to action for our next steps. Um, so first what we'll do is we will have a um, time for Rachel Ray, who is our um, UC Immigrant Legal Services uh, representative here. And she'll give a, a quick update um, on both the federal and state um, legislation that's going on currently, um, as well as we will bring up a panel of um, participants. Uh, we'll have Dr. Um, David Wafsey uh, from the School of Medicine. We'll have Anna Cruz from the School of Pharmacy. And we'll have uh, Walter Mancia from the Graduate Division, specifically BN BMS. So first, let's go ahead and get started with our um, legal updates from Rachel Ray, and then we'll bring the panel up to start some questions um, and questions and answers. Thank you. Hi, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Rachel Ray, and I'm a managing attorney at the UC Immigrant Legal Services Center. We're housed at UC Davis, but we serve nine of the 10 UC campuses. Um, Berkeley has their own program, and we serve every other campus. We provide immigration legal services to UC students and their immediate family members. Um, some more information about our services is available up front, and I welcome any questions after the presentation. Um, my campus is UCSF, so I serve UCSF students and um, their immediate family members. If you're not familiar with our services, I certainly encourage you to access them. We're here to help you, and I love working with UCSF students. So. Um, my purpose here today is to briefly summarize the changes to DACA and also give an overview of the, legis the federal legislation and state legislation that um, is working towards assisting individuals with DACA. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with what DACA is, I'll give a very, very brief overview. Um, DACA is not legislation. It's an executive action taken to provide work authorization and protection for deportation or removal for individuals who meet certain criteria. And those individuals are individuals who don't have felony convictions, um, don't have serious misdemeanor convictions, uh, satisfies some physical presence requirements, education requirements, and came to the United States before a particular age. Um, so that, that executive order uh, went into effect in 2012. And so as of today, around 800,000 individuals have received DACA. And what that means is they currently have protection from deportation and also have work authorization, which is hugely important. So on Tuesday, the administration announced that as of Tuesday, they would not be accepting any new or initial DACA applications, which means that young people who had not yet been able to access the, the benefits of DACA will not be able to access the benefits of DACA. Um, also between September 5th and October 5th, um, so we have four weeks to get in renewal applications, and those applications are only for individuals who have um, DACA benefits or work authorization cards that will expire between September 5th and March 5th of 2018. Um, those dates are really important because individuals who have DACA and do um, fit into those criteria and that they, their DACA benefits will expire by March 5th, 2018 or between September 5th and March 5th, 2018 should renew their um, DACA and their work authorization. There are lots of organizations offering to do this for free um, and I've been sending Alejandra information about um, organizations in the Bay Area that are providing those services. I can provide those services to UCSF students and their family members. Um, so these renewals must be accepted by October 5th. That's an important date to keep in mind for DACA recipients. Um, they will not be accepted after October 5th. Uh, individuals who currently have DACA, so current work authorization and uh, protection from deportation will remain valid for their validity periods. DACA is usually granted for two years. So individuals who have DACA and work authorization will be able to obtain those benefits, or will, will be able to retain those benefits until those benefits expire. There's a little date on a work authorization card, and that's the date by which the authorization expires. So unfortunately, what that means from a really practical perspective is that individuals who say their work authorization expires March 6th, 
they cannot renew their DACA. So they will only have their work authorization until March 6th. And this is a lot of individuals who this affects. So um, the announcement benefits the individuals whose work authorization expires between September 5th and March 5th. So they get an extra two years of work authorization and protection from deportation. And it is, I can only imagine what it would be like for individuals whose work authorization, authorization expires in March or April. Um, so uh, I think it's important to note there, there's some information on the table out front about how to work with DACA beneficiaries and also um, there's a, a really great resource that the Immigrant Legal Resource Center put out um, that I'll try to show you. Um, that's on the table. And it speaks to, I'm sorry, I can't find it this very minute, but it speaks to what, um, what, what happens to work authorization once it expires or what might happen after March 5th. And so that document looks like this. Um, I think it's really important to to underscore something that the um, California Labor Commission has underscored, which is that employers are not required to re-verify work authorization after September 5th's announcement. So some other things that are important to know, we get a lot of questions about independent contractors and um, working without authorization. It is not lawful to work without authorization and there can be immigration related effects to working without authorization. So for individuals who work, whose work authorization expires or for individuals who employ such such people, it's important to remember that um, it is unlawful to work without authorization, though many people do, um, and also pay taxes. I think it's important to note. Um, but employers are not required to re-verify work authorization. And then in terms of independent contractors, sometimes this is talked about or proposed as a sort of fix all, um, it's still unlawful to work without authorization. And independent contractors cannot employ individuals who they know to be undocumented. And I'm not an employment attorney, it's not my field of expertise, but some of that is discussed in, um, in this document. And so if you're interested in that topic, I, I think they did a really thorough job of answering questions here. Um, so along with the, the announcement related specifically to DACA on Tuesday, um, another issue that arises is the ability to leave the country. For, so DACA recipients previously, um, if they fit certain criteria, were allowed to leave the United States and with permission to come back in. That permission is called advanced parole. And so that was really helpful to lots of different people. Um, the UC students would use it to study abroad. Um, individuals use it to visit ailing family members. So if somebody with DACA had a family member who was dying, they were able to seek emergency advanced parole and go visit that family member. Um, with the announcement on Tuesday, the government will no longer accept or approve new applications, which means that even if somebody has a dying family member, they can't go into an immigration services office and request to go see that dying family member. Um, they will also administratively close pending advanced parole applications and return the filing fees, thankfully. Um, but they will not accept or approve new applications and they will they, the USCIS has stated that they will honor um, granted advanced parole applications. So individuals who are outside the country or who already have a grant of advanced parole theoretically can leave, but it's always discretionary whether or not Customs and Border Protection lets that individual return to the United States. So um, I think it's really important for individuals who have approved advanced parole to talk with an attorney and exercise caution when they're seeking to, the retur to return to the United States. I think in an abundance of caution, somebody might not want to leave the United States or might want to return immediately. Um, but that is a personal choice and I highly recommend somebody work with an attorney if they're in that situation. So um, just to underscore and wrap up kind of what happened on Tuesday, it's really important that anybody who can renew and who is not, who does not have um, another pending benefit, um, renew their DACA before October 5th. That's the deadline. So keep that in mind if you interact with individuals who are documented. Um, and then in terms of what allies and other people who want to support documented individuals can do, um, encourage complete immigration screenings. So that's one of the things that our, our office offers. It's, it's a service that nonprofits offer, that private attorneys offer. Um, Alejandra has a referral list for the Bay Area. If you have individuals who you want refer referrals for outside of the Bay Area, I can also provide those referrals. Um, we're really lucky to be in the Bay Area where we have a wealth of, of resources. Um, but also, uh, all of those resources are really impacted since the election, and so there may be a wait. 
That said, encourage anyone you know to get a comprehensive screening. They may be eligible for relief that they didn't know about prior to a screening, and that's a way that you can help people. Um, I also encourage everyone to be aware of their rights, um, and it's possible for allies to organize Know Your Rights presentations. The ACLU um, does offer those presentations. I know it can be kind of hard to get those scheduled. We also offer Know Your Rights presentations for students, um, and I work with some UC Davis Law students who um, are really excited to come to UCSF and do presentations to individuals here. So if that's of interest to you or your department, I encourage you to contact me. Um, and I have a pocket full of business cards, so you're welcome to come, con to come and talk with me after, um, after this, this panel. So to be sensitive to the time, I'm going to sort of breeze through the pending legislation and try to only take a couple more minutes. So um, there, there are three uh, pieces of federal legis legislation that, that are being discussed. The, I'm going to talk about them in no particular order. Um, all of the bills have some Republican support. Um, none has a critical mass of support yet. So all of these are, are not a, a sure bet. So one is the Bridge Act, which is sort of a congressional act um, that would be similar to DACA. Um, it would be protection from deportation or removal, work authorization for three years, um, and those three years would allow time for Congress to come up with some sort of permanent solution. Um, this is sort of a bare bones fix. Uh, the next is the RAC Act, or the Recognizing America's Children Act. Um, this is primarily Republican-backed. Um, it would allow conditional permanent residency. So permanent residency can be thought of as a green card. Um, it's permission to work and permission to be in the United States um, more or less permanently. Conditional permanent residency is what it sounds like. It's conditional based on certain conditions, which I won't go into right now. Um, so under the RAC Act, that per conditional permanent residency would be offered for individuals who arrived before 16, have been in the U.S. for at least five years, meet certain educational and criminal requirements, meaning they don't have criminal convictions, um, and those, those requirements would be similar to DACA. After those five years, um, individuals who are recipients of the benefits under the RAC Act can apply for regular lawful permanent residency or green cards and then naturalize to become citizens. Um, but their status can be revoked if they're not in school or not employed. So it's a little more limited than... Um, than the DREAM Act, which I'll talk about next. So the DREAM Act is primarily Democrat-backed and would allow conditional lawful permanent residence for um, individuals who've been in the United States since age 18, so slightly older than the RAC Act, and lived in the United States for four years as opposed to five under the RAC Act. Um, it would also allow temporary protected status recipients to apply for conditional permanent residency. And individuals can apply for full green cards or remove the conditions from their, their conditional permanent residency. Um, if they keep their employment or they work for a certain amount of time. So I know I'm breezing through all these things. It's complex litigation. There's lots of information about it online, and I'm happy to share those resources as well. Um, so as they stand, these bills won't likely have enough support to pass. So what, what, we're, what they would require would be a you know, majority vote from Senator and, and the House um, to pass. A bill would likely need to address immigration issues beyond DACA. So we're here today to talk about DACA. But it looks like in order for compre comprehensive immigration reform to happen, a package would need to include um, some, something that addresses border enforcement. So that's where the discussion of the wall might come in. Um, and it has comprehensive reform has a different meaning for different members in Congress. Um, so that's just a really brief overview. In terms of California legislation, there are dozens of immigration adjacent bills or bills that would benefit immigrants. And those bills are really um, beautifully outlined by the California Immigrant Policy Center. Um, I can share that as a resource as well. Um, one thing to highlight is SB 54, which is the California Values Act, and it limits state and local law enforcement agencies, including some school police um, and security departments, from engaging in immigration enforcement or using state or local resources and carrying out enforcement. So one of the things that um, the current administration likes to do is, is deputize local law enforcement agents to carry out federal immigration work. Um, and I think that's a complex constitutional issue. Immigration is a federal matter. On the flip side, when states take their own initiatives, like California, that's more immigrant friendly, there's a benefit to states um, being involved in immigration. Um, so the Values Act expands the existing Trust Act um, by prohibiting transfer of, individu of individuals information um, into federal custody for deportation without a warrant signed by a judge. So 
it's pretty, this, this issue is pretty nuanced, and I'm happy to talk about it after the presentation. But there are multiple other bills aimed at protecting immigrants, and um, there's no new legislation in California since Tuesday, um, but there are conversations um, moving in the government right now, and the only official act is that they, the AG, the only semi-official act is that the AG has announced that um, he, California will plan to file a lawsuit similar to the lawsuit that um, the 15 other attorneys general have filed. So um, I apologize for speaking so quickly. I was trying to fit a lot into that short amount of time, and I'll um, turn the panel over. But I look forward to speaking with some of you after, after the presentation. Thank you. All right. So um, I'd like to introduce our panel members so you can put faces to names. Uh, sitting next to me is uh, Walter Mancia, again from the Graduate Division. Uh, we have Anna Cruz from the School of Pharmacy, and we have Dr. David Wafsey from the uh, Associate Dean um, for um, Admissions in the School of Medicine. So yesterday we had a chance to talk with one another and kind of um, decide a little bit about what we might want to share with you. And we thought one of the best ways was to get to know um, our students and get to know uh, how uh, these policies are going to directly affect them. And so I wanted to pose a question to Anna and Walter about if you could maybe share a little bit about your journey to UCSF um, and, and some of the implications about not having DACA status. So I did not, I guess I, I started off on, uh, didn't have the ability to get DACA because I was, before it was enacted, um, I was waiting for it to come through. Um, I was able to be a beneficiary of AB 540, which is a, a law that, a California law that allows uh, students to pay uh, in state tuition instead of out of state. Um, so through that, um, I was able to work um, on the side and go to school full time as well. Um, and I save up money to pay for college. Um, just because I didn't qualify for any financial aid. Um, and because of, I didn't have the opportunity for DACA to, um, it, didn't, it didn't go through at the time when I was going through this. I just kind of waited, unfortunately. Um, I graduated college uh, 2009, um, so DACA hadn't come through. Um, so I do remember uh, sitting in front of the TV uh, and waiting for a decision of DACA to come through because I knew how much it would have benefited me. Um, I always wanted to go to pharmacy school, so I just went through other, at the time, um, I was very shy. Um, up until recently, I've actually talked about what I've lived. Uh, so I, I decided to wait until I applied to professional school until my status changed. Um, so I just remember waiting a few years um, until something came along for me. So that's how I went about Without DACA. Okay. So uh, my name is Walter, and I'm halfway through my PhD here at UCSF, and I'm already planning when I'm going to leave the U.S. and where I am going to go. So as it is right now, um, as soon as I finish, I basically wouldn't be able to work because I don't have any type of work permit, paper, anything that would allow me to legally work. And so being a postdoc is just not an option. Um, and so going back, um, why I did not qualify for DACA, so I don't remember anymore uh, exactly when I came to, to the U.S., and it doesn't matter. Uh, but I came here uh, all by myself. All my family is back in my country. And I think I was, I don't know, two or three months late or earlier, so... You know, a few days can, can define you know, the next 10, 20 years of your life. Um, and anyway, if I have come here, you know, three months before, it wouldn't matter because when I came here, I had to work. Uh, 
I work until I turn 18 uh, to support myself and to help my mom back in uh, Honduras. And so I only started going to school when I was like 18 uh, to learn English, so it didn't matter. I tried to apply, but it didn't work. Um, so it was quite a, a journey coming to UCSF and uh, you know speaking to the admissions people, uh, uh, people who do the, uh, what is it, the financial aid, uh, trying to explain how I, how I, I was uh, going to be able to maybe qualify for in-state in tuition because, you know, it's, it's not feasible for me that who, a person who cannot work to pay $20,000 extra, right, you know, to go to college. Uh, so that's, that's really stressful uh, when you're trying to focus on, on, on your academics. And it does, uh, it will reflect and will affect uh, whatever you're doing at the moment. Uh, but I'm here, and uh, we'll see uh, where we go from here. Right, thank you very much. Um, and I think we um, might ask um, Dr. Um, David Wafsi, perhaps you might be able to answer the question, what, given what we're dealing with right now, what are the implications for our pipeline? Those that want to, um, they may be in the audience and also be interested in coming to uh, US, UCSF to enter into any of the health professions, but specifically within the School of Medicine. Sure. Um, so it, in some sense, we're in a period where talk is easy, and I'm recognizing that what I'm about to say is easy. Uh, actually, living it out is going to be hard. So what do I mean by that? Uh, our admissions policy in the School of Medicine and throughout UCSF is that we do not discriminate on the basis of, uh, uh, of immigration status. That extends beyond DACA. Our statements don't just refer to DACA, it refers to undocumented applicants. Mm -hmm. So independent of the DACA debate that's going on, mm -hmm. UCSF's policy is that we accept applications without uh, prejudice from undocumented applicants. Uh, And that's, um, that's a fundamental principle for most of us. That's a principle that we would still believe in six months from now in a worst case scenario. And most of us uh, would not function in our jobs if we were forced to implement any other policy. Um, so uh, that's the first comment with respect to admissions. Then there's also the question of financial aid that has come up a little bit already. It's a complicated issue, so I'll, for the moment, simply say um, that we have no intention to change our financial aid policy, which also is applied without discrimination. Now, that's easier said than done because many of the loans that are available to people are federal loans and therefore not available to undocumented students. And we deal with this problem already uh, here with respect to scholarships but we would not change our own approach to the administration of financial support. Um, it's easy to cite laws that protect us from cooperating with ICE, but we all know that uh, there are forces in this country that would challenge those laws at this point. So for now, we certainly have a very strong policy that we would not share any information about our students with ICE. And as you've heard from uh, Rachel Ray, um, only under circumstances of, of a court order would that be something that we would consider. I'm not sure whether we would accept that court order. My guess is we would fight it in court. Um, so on the other hand, th that's why I say talk is easy. The government has a lot of information, as you know, on undocumented students and may not need it from us. Um, and finally, the same uh, principles apply at the levels of the residency and fellowship training programs within the School of Medicine. There's no discrimination based on immigration status. Um, now, what's the practice? So ordinarily, I think I would be a little uncomfortable sitting up in front of a room implying anything that would identify students uh, in terms of saying, whether we actually walk the walk with respect to these policies. But fortunately, we've had some very courageous undocumented 
DACA students in our community who have identified themselves and who have been leaders in this area and set an example for all of us. So that makes it easy for me to say without, without uh, jeopardizing anybody's status that there are indeed undocumented students at UCSF and undocumented students in the, in the School of Medicine who we're proud of and who have been leaders in this area. Thank you. Uh, So you just made me think of something, and I've, this will go back to um, Anna and Walter, and I'm curious about, there's a lot of people out in our community, whether it's fellow students, it's faculty, um, it's staff, all over that want to support. And I'm curious, during your journey, how has a particular faculty or other people supported you? And how can those that are interested in doing so, do so? Well, like I mentioned before, um, I was very shy. So um, I was raised um, to stay quiet about my status. Um, I felt ashamed of it. Um, so I never really talked about it and I never, um, I think it was just me and my parents that really knew my status. Um, uh, so when I came to UCSF, uh, the very, it was during orientation we're talking about diversity. And I don't know what it was, what came over me, but mm -hmm. I felt that it was time for me to be myself and open up. Um, so I, I actually told my story. Um, so mind you, this is my first day of <laughs> pharmacy school, <laughs> brand new cohort. Um, but I just felt so welcomed by everyone and I felt that it was an open space um, and I could finally be myself. So the past, I'm a fourth year now, so the past four years or three years have been an emotional roller coaster. That first year was very emotional because it was me talking for the very first time and acknowledging that I was undocumented and that I was okay and that I it was okay to be undocumented and not feel like I was lower than anyone. Um, so I can't thank UCSF Pharmacy School in specific enough for bringing, being so open. Um, so I think what really helped was knowing that there's no judgment. Um, and I think if you can translate it to people that there's no judgment and people can come to you, I think that's of great support um, because you don't know what other people are living or going through. Um, and I think that's what, you know, for what about those people that might still be hiding? Um, if you wanna offer some support, I think that's a great start. Just letting people know that you're open and it's, it's a safe space um, and let them be who they are so that they're not ashamed of themselves. Thank you. <clears throat> you know, sharing your weakness makes you very vulnerable. And so I don't go out there and saying, hey, I'm undocumented, right? And this is the first time I'm actually doing it in public because you don't know what kind of people are out there. I haven't even told my class that I am undocumented. Some of them might just be finding out right now. Um, but you must do what you cannot do, right? Um, and so, uh, fortunately, UCSF and uh, where I was before at UCLA uh, was a very safe space. Um, and we have a group of people here uh, that we meet once in a while. And in the Bay Area, we have also a very supportive group, and especially for people who don't have DACA or people who have DACA to meet and discuss possibilities. Um, but uh, in terms of education, uh, I was always very open with my professors uh, when I went there and I told them, you know, I am undocumented. Even when I was applying to grad school, uh, you know, what can I do? Uh, who can I talk to? So uh, I think it's very important to, to be open, at least with the, with the right people. And UCSF uh, fortunately has a very um, safe space where, where there's plenty of people who are helping out and that's, that's really amazing. Thank you very much.
I'm going to ask a kind of an ignorant, practical question, and I'm curious, um, being part of the LGBT community, we have our rainbow stickers and we have ways that we can show people without you having to expose yourself first, and I'm curious, is there anything that we can do in a very practical, basic way that can represent that we're a safe space to talk to? Anything that you've seen or you've experienced um, that might um, give some ideas to our staff, community, and fellow faculty and students? Well, I got the pleasure of meeting uh, an artist, Fabiana Rodriguez, and she has this beautiful drawing of a butterfly. Um, in the bottom it says, migration is beautiful. Um, so whenever I see that, I know that that person or whoever it may be, it's a safe space for me. So it might not be... I don't know, it's very subtle, so I just always recognize it when I see it. You know it's safe. Thank you. All right. So we did want to spend about 20 minutes opening it up for questions um, or comments from the audience. Um, keep in mind, we also want to um, include you in the conversation about call to action. So if there are particular people that have a comment, a question, um, we will run a microphone to you. Um, and be able to hopefully answer the question or at least discuss it. Anybody has it? Okay. We have a couple, so I think if we can grab one of these. Oh, I'm the only one, huh? Okay. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Ozer. Um, thank you so much to this panel and also to the um, uh, person uh, from about the legal implications. My question was a little more about the legal implications. And um, my understanding is that there are a lot of lawsuits being filed right now. I mean, you mentioned the ACLU, others. So I know that you were interpreting this as right now, this is what will happen. And I wondered if there was any discussion of how these lawsuits could hold this up. Um, so thank you for your question. Um, so <laughs> really briefly, an analogy to what I do is um, like I'm, I'm not a general practitioner. Um, I'm the equivalent of like a podiatrist. So um, I'm not a federal litigator. <laughs> um, I'm not a federal litigator. So I help individuals with their individual cases. Um, the short answer is you know, litigation can stop activity with injunctions. So it is possible that a lawsuit could generate an injunction that would, um, prior to March 5th or prior to the expiration of certain individuals' um, DACA benefits, it's possible that an injunction could prohibit the government from moving forward with uh, taking away those benefits. That's, I don't, I say that with very little official knowledge, but that's my supposition. I saw some other hands. Anybody else have a question? A couple there. Um, hi, thank you for having this um, discussion. The question is a little more specific about our students who are DACA, and this is going to be specific to medicine, but I imagine it might um, spread. But thinking about past education, specifically residency, if there isn't federal funding for those spots, how are we supporting our students and ensuring that there is a there's an option after graduation? So I'm not certain. Um, uh, I think to apply that across a broad range because there are many residency programs and there are many fellowship training programs it may be hard to generalize. I know that our current policy at UCSF uh, would be to accept people into residencies uh, without regard to their immigration status. As you point out, that would limit the options with respect to sources of funding. But when, when UCSF says this is our policy, these are our principles, we're going to accept somebody into it, it's not done with the notion that we won't pay that person their salary. So I think 
the, the answer at the residency level here uh, is that that would not be an obstacle. But it's not hard to look beyond that to how do you then approach having a career without having to lay plans for moving somewhere else. I think that's where the big obstacles will come in. Um, I have a two-part question. The first question is, is I know UCSF provided a lot of financial support as well as was very active both in D.C. and California when there was the potential for NIH um, to decrease funding. And I was wondering if we can expect UCSF to provide the same level of financial support as well as legislative advocacy around this as for um, Stand Up for Science and during that time in March. Um, and then my second question would be, um, Besides, like, just to go on, like, what should we, like, in terms of the School of Medicine specifically, uh, what procedures are currently in place for students around, like, giving financial support to their families? Like, we're talking, I think we just need a little bit more details for people who, um, like, specifically with financial aid, who are supporting their families already. So I wonder, Jerry, if you'd want to at least make some general comments. Jerry Lopez from the Office of Financial Aid is here and can address at least part of your question, and I won't ignore the other part, the first part. Sure. Uh, I want to make sure I capture both parts of those questions, and I think the first was related more to students who are receiving graduate funding through the NIH and uh, the possibility of those funds uh, being diminished and replaced with something else. And uh, I am, our office uh, specializes more in professional students, not graduate level funding. I'm not sure if Liz Silva is, is in the room right now. Uh, she's more uh, the person who helps to coordinate those graduate funds and I don't see her here. So um, I can certainly make sure that uh, Liz Silva helps to answer that question. In regards to the other part of that question uh, where you had asked about financial support for students, um, I think we've gone over this, but I just want to review one more time. The state of California allows us to help fund DACA students who are AB 540. And in that, we are able to uh, look at financial need and award students uh, state scholarship dollars to help them uh, meet a portion of their cost of attendance. Uh, we, on top of that, have uh, funding through endowments to provide loan funds to students as well, and typically that is about $10,000 per year. There's a big shortfall between those two items, between the cost of attendance, the scholarship, and the university loan dollars that we have, and what's remaining. And through that, uh, we work with students, uh, DACA students, to help find uh, private loan dollars, private educational loans, and with some success and with many challenges. Um, those private loans in some cases and usually require U.S. co-signers and that immediately becomes a challenge for us. So as we look at what can be included in a cost of attendance budget to include all of these educational fundings, to include other kinds of costs, um, we try to find the dollars to go with that. And um, that's, that's the work that our office has been doing for the past several years. Thank you. Did would you like to follow up with? Yes. So on. so let me start by saying in the clearest possible sense that I agree with the spirit and the intent of that comment. 
we need to be activists in this area, and we need to go beyond talking about it. There's no question that our leadership are involved in um, efforts to fight this at, at the level of Washington. Um, but you make a different, you make an additional point, and I'm hoping that Renee will comment on this as well. And that is, <clears throat> there's a value to visible opposition that goes beyond the important things that are done by the people who are challenging these changes in court or writing letters to Congress people or advocating for this specific bill or that specific bill. I think you make the point appropriately that that's crucially important and that our leadership has to be involved in that. And I think it's the easiest answer for me is unequivocally, yes, that's happening. But the other point you make I think is equally important and that there is a real value for many reasons to visible opposition and visible opposition from people in leadership. And I think that, as you've pointed out, that's happened on other issues on this campus over the course of time, and it would be important for it to happen on this issue as well. I don't know if you want to address it in, in general terms yourself, Renee. Thank you for the question. And certainly um, the chancellor and the chancellor's executive team have had some conversations about how do we respond appropriately and how do we make sure that we show our support and advocacy. I think making this event today so that we could uh, stand shoulder to shoulder with other members in our campus community is an important first step following the chancellor's le letter to the campus community. The question is, and the charge, and I think part of our responsibility here today is to define what should our call of act to action be we have a full-time lobbyist, essentially, who is in Washington, D.C., who we work with, who the chancellor has gone with to several members of Congress. Um, we have our Office of Community Relations and Government Affairs under our Vice Chancellor, Barb French. I don't know if anybody from the office is here today, a photographer, but um, <laughs> here today. But certainly that is a part of what um, are on the list of items that we're advocating for. Other members of the Chancellor's leadership team in the office, uh, in the audience today, are here. Our Vice Chancellor Jaime Sepulveda. We have our Dean from the School of Pharmacy. Um, so leaders are engaged in this issue, and I think uh, the visible coalition of support is a critical uh, next step forward. So I will look to you to help us define what those actions should be. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Following up on Twitter's question, would uh, the school consider supporting students to go to DC um, to also be able to provide information? Budget? No. <laughs> <laughs> Renee? I, 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 I can't imagine why we wouldn't. Um, I think that we should yeah. actually look at, at that and how we can orchestrate that and provide the support. We support our students in other areas and other ways, and this is critically important as well. So you can email, email me. <laughs> <laughs> diversity, diversity and outreach at UCSF.edu. Just email me and we can um, work on that. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Saw one up. Okay, you, <laughs> we have loud talkers here. We, yeah, we have one. Or we, have one or, yeah. we do. We have one.
Alejandra, so, let's speak. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, thanks to everyone for showing up because we did put this together with you know less than a week, so it's impressive that all of you are here. Thank you for that, and to my colleague Lamisa Hill for for helping us. Uh, so next steps, we have a group that has been meeting here for the past three years. That it's a, a coalition, a UCSF coalition, I would call it, of UCSF students, faculty, and staff. Uh, Dr. Whoopsie, the students, uh, and many staff members, primarily uh, obviously from the financial aid office, and we meet with some regularity. Uh, we're meeting next. Uh, Wednesday, September 13th at noon here in Parnassus. You can email our office and we'll send you more information. And we're talking about very specific things that we can do. Some of them along what are the obstacles that the students are going to be facing in their educational trajectory. I think some of the students are already alluded to that, the residency and all that. But there will be more things. How could we work with alumni to perhaps fundraise so we can uh, increase the funding available to the students. And so there'll be different things that we're talking about. This is the group that came up with a statement in support uh, for our admissions uh, pages across UCSF. This is the group that supported the students organizing. So we've been doing this for a couple of years. Uh, it's been mainly an effort that Lamisha and I have held. We would love to have more support. Uh, and so we welcome you uh, next Wednesday, September 13th at noon. Uh, email us and also our website is updated uh, right now on hourly basis with everything that's coming up. So welcome uh, your thoughts and your input. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for about one, qu one, more, one more question up in the back as well. Yeah. Thank you. So um, let me start with what will may sound a little evasive. That's why I hesitated, <laughs> but I'll try not to be evasive in the long run. I think it's very important to coordinate these activities. And Alejandra's <laughs> comment a moment ago is, I think, the right way to go. There, at some point, there has to be some prioritization of action, right? Some political strategy, and um, and I think that's developed when a group comes together and really considers various options. So I, I think it's it's not just a matter of, well, what, do I, what would I like, which is the way the question was phrased. I do think the point you make is very important, that we have to think about tangible ways to support the people in our community who are threatened. Uh, and that includes um, financial support, which has been alluded to, and thinking through how do you generate appropriate financial support. At the present time, as I say, our scholarship financial aid is assigned without regard to immigration status. Um, and often the people who are DACA students have the greatest need and therefore are uh, recipients of large scholarships. But now we're operating in an era where the needs that people face and that their families face are probably unusual and go beyond that. And that we have to figure out a way to go beyond that. But I don't think we're just talking about money here. I think we have to think about some worst case scenarios and, and really preparing for them. Uh, and we haven't discussed that today and we're not gonna discuss it now, but you know, unfortunately, this era has echoes of other eras we've experienced. For, for me, um, I think about you know, the history of UCSF during the period of internment of Japanese students who were taken off campus and who in many cases were housed and supported and hidden by other members of the community, by faculty members of the community. So I think, you know, it's easy to talk now about what we'll do over the course of the next six months and to move with optimism that the degree of opposition at this point will protect us from reaching a point of worst case scenario. But I do think we don't want to be surprised when that day comes. So I think that there needs to be some foundation laid for sort of a political preparation for what if. And I think that goes beyond just raising money for people. Thank you. Lastly, I would, oh, I'm sorry. I would Please. like to add something to that. 
Um, I think that sometimes we forget that mental health is very important. These times are very, very difficult. Um, so I think that it's something that we have to keep in mind that a lot of members in the community, whether affected or not, are going through very, very rough times. So if you can even lend you know, a shoulder to cry on or someone to hear you out, because it's better to cry with someone than to cry in your room alone. So I think it's something to keep in mind and something that I don't, haven't heard much. Um, mental, mental health, something to keep in mind. Thank you so much. And one more comment and then we'll close. So very quickly, there's an event on Saturday, October 7th that um, I believe Lamisha and Alejandra have publicized some. It's been being put on by a coalition of UCSF um, doctors and community members and other Bay Area medical professionals. And it's a symposium uh, about the crossover between immigration and health. And I think it would be great for everybody here to show up to that as well. Um, there'll be a series of panels talking about um, how to be supportive as a, as a healthcare professional. Um, I believe the symposium is called All Are Welcome. And I'm sorry, I don't have the specifics in front of me, but um, it's being put on by UCSF students and Lamish and Alejandra, I believe, have the information and have, have disseminated it. So look out for that. It's Saturday, October 7th, I believe in East Bay. It's all day. So I want to um, be mindful of, of the time and to thank our panel and willingness and uh, uh, vulnerability to be here today. So thank you very much. Again, thank you for everybody that attended and your willingness to learn, uh, be informed, and look for ways to advocate. And thank you again for the organization. Thank you.